-hmm. And it was all about how you have to go to the theater as if you were going to a lover. Did you have to, you really should, uh, you know, have a very special uh, bath with um, perfume in it and you should get dressed your best because this is the way you should present yourself mm. to this medium, which right. was a, a, a loving and a, really a soul kind of thing. He used to be very eloquent, he still is, still is. Sure. He, gives, um, he gives workshops on, um, uh, what was it? It was very helpful when I went to it. It wasn't on fundraising, but it was on something as important as that. And it was very, uh, very witty and very, very interesting. Do you know what he did after he left in 63? Where he went? Did he go to Toronto right away? Yeah, he went to Toronto. Yeah, I don't know. And I think his wife was the PR or, yeah, I think the PR for one of the leading theatres, mm -hmm. you know, if not Stratford, something like, not Stratford, but something like that. Anytime. Are the glasses okay? They're no reflecting? Um, no, they only reflect if you turn too much that way. Okay. That way? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Well, so you're ready to go? <coughs> one of the things you mentioned to me on the phone, I didn't have in my notes, but I actually uh, was intrigued about was the international players, because uh, you went there. <laughs> and uh, I, were you there, uh, I know that Robertson Davies had, had involvement with him, uh, were you there at the same time or did you ever pass cross? Uh, no, never. Uh, no, I'm sorry about that. Well, there's yeah. still time. Yeah. We're both still around. Um, yes, the international players was Drew Thompson and Arthur Sutherland. And they did summer stock in a hotel, the Queen's Hotel in Kingston, Ontario. And it was pay-as-you-like theatre, which meant that, that the audience paid what they liked at the end of the second act. So if you had a second act that didn't have a boffo ending, you rewrote it so that you could get in as much money as possible. And this was my first job. I was actually between years. You know, in those days, there were no schools in Canada. So one had to choose between going to Britain or going to the States. And all my friends went to Yale from UBC and Dorothy Somerset's inspiration. They went to Yale. And I went to Goodman in Chicago. And I was between my first year and my second year. I was looking for a summer job. And uh, Drew asked me to come up and be the director for the international players. And I directed, uh, there were 13 plays in 13 weeks. And I directed 12 of them, played the lead in two of them, and uh, was in. If, the, if it was necessary, I was in all the others. Arnold Edinburgh, who was teaching Shakespeare at Queen's at the time, and his wife Letty was in some of the shows, I remember. But you know, I can't believe that that was possible. Because you, you played six days a week, and on the Sunday, which was the day off, you repainted, rearranged and repainted the set, reupholstered the furniture, and um, learned your lines. And then you rehearsed, of course, in the afternoon and, and played every night. And summer stock was like that in, in Vancouver. But I think by the, in BC, but I think by then we were taking two weeks, something reasonable, like two weeks rehearsal and a few more days off to get ready for the next one. But that was my first job. Can you imagine? I mean, it's like, it's like my husband used to do a half hour drama a week on the CBC. For about seven years, he did half hour drama a week. And if you get two or three now, a year, you're really very busy. But it was an exciting time, and it probably just having that much, being able to direct and produce, and it must have been just exhilarating in a way to have all that. I think it was, yes. I remember it as being that. But, but I just, whether it's, it's probably as you get older, you, uh, or as you get more experienced, you demand more of your standards and... Uh, and so maybe, maybe it wasn't as good as I thought it was. Certainly when that critic from Toronto, um, Nathan, Nathan uh, Cohen, Nathan Cohen arrived one, one week, and he was the big critic at the time, and the big um, <clears throat> critical critic. Um, his, uh, there was a story at the time that if you got really, really uh, destroyed by Nathan Cohen, you were in very good company. 
Uh, he came and saw, I, I remember we used to play every week, we used to play Laura, the song from the movie Laura, because we were going to do Laura the play and then we could never get this ingenue to come up from Toronto. So week after week we played Laura and I think he finally arrived on the week we did Laura. I didn't keep any of those clippings or anything. Um, and yet there was, there was a lot of material from there, from those days. And what did Nathan say? Oh, he absolutely said it was just, uh, it was, uh, it was, he's very sarcastic. That was the thing that really hurt. I can't remember. I remember him saying it wasn't worth going to see and it was a lot of, of uh, trash and uh, the performances weren't any good. And that's how I remember it. I don't know. Uh, probably a little out of order here, but uh, in 1948, um, could you tell me a little bit about the UBC Players Club from your perspective and what it is? Yes, the, the UBC Players Club was the creation of, um, of Freddie Wood, of Frederick Wood, uh, who was in the English department at UBC and who was the person, I heard Dorothy Somerset once give a lecture that said, you know, uh, Freddie came back from Yale, I guess it was. He went to Yale either to teach or to study. And he brought back to Vancouver the modern playwrights. And I thought our modern playwrights, what we consider the modern period, you know, mm -hmm. O'Neill, Williams, that kind of thing. And then finally after describing this thing, she said, Chekhov and Ibsen. And Freddie was the person who brought theatre to UBC and consequently in those days to Vancouver, although there's a, I feel there's a separation now between the campus and Vancouver. But he brought, um, he brought theatre to, to UBC and he founded the uh, Players Club. And of course there was no department there, there was no department in all of Canada, there was no, there was no place you could go and study theatre. So there were, there were two things, at UBC you could, uh, you could uh, be in the Players Club show uh, in the fall or in the spring, and the spring one in my time toured the province because it was just post-war. And uh, the president, uh, Mackenzie, Norman Mackenzie, felt that if he sent the Players Club out as ambassadors into the province that that could do more good for the university than anything else could do. There hasn't been such a uh, far-seeing and uh, sympathetic to the arts president since, I don't think. Uh, so that's what we did and that's how I saw the rest of the province was touring with the Players Club. And uh, that's how Holiday Theatres Tours, which was the first children's theatre, that's how they got set up because I learned, I knew people in each place and I could set up my tours later using these people as my contact. But uh, the first the first tours were very, very exciting when we went into the province. It must have been a sense that this was the first theatre for a lot of people to be experienced when you went to some of the smaller communities. And yes, well, uh, th th this is true. In that we took Shakespeare, we took plays that they wouldn't mount themselves. Uh, what was One was A Taming of the Shrew, and the other one was a play called Barclay Square, which has since been done by, by the Shaw Festival. Um, there was everywhere in Canada a very rich and very uh, experimental and exciting amateur theatre, everywhere. And the reason for its richness was whoever was in the university doing extension work in each province. And in almost, each, in, in almost every case, it was a woman. In, in British Columbia, it was Dorothy Somerset. In Alberta, it was Betty Mitchell, and so on. You can go right across. There was one man in Saskatchewan, but the rest of them were women. And they, uh, they went out and, and taught directing and acting. They did workshops, weekend workshops, week-long workshops. They went into places and actually directed plays, developed the directors there, developed the actors there. And this, uh, this was so rich and so uh, fertile uh, in everywhere. It was, the, it was the life's blood during the war uh, when there wasn't much traveling, was that the theater community grew, mostly with women, of course, because all the men were away at war. 
but um, this grew into competitive festivals in each province and these the winners of these went to the Dominion Drama Festival which was founded in you'll have to find out what year uh, by the Governor General and uh, and this meant that people who who are our pioneers are our first, the people that you're interested in, that are our first uh, actors and directors, really always emerged through either the CBC or through the universities and into that stream which was the DDF. And then the top actors would win the DDF and either go south or stay here and do what I did, which was to found uh, the many things that we have now right. that are all being wiped out, but never mind, yes, that will, it will change. Was this uh, where you first in, uh, met Sydney Risk? Was it was with the UBC players, or had you? I don't think so. I think Sydney at that time was in, in Alberta oh, yeah. and, and at Banff. And uh, his Everyman Theatre really started out at Banff. Now, there were two places in Canada where you could go to find out how good you were. And one was Banff Summer School of the Theatre. And the other was Dorothy Somerset Summer School of the Theatre at UBC. And these were really high quality teaching, very intense, eight in the morning till at least nine at night, uh, classes all day, rehearsals all afternoon and evening. And both these um, summer schools brought in directors from outside, sometimes a British director, mostly an American director, not thinking we had any of our own yet. Uh, and these, these people provided you with uh, a touchstone, with something that, uh, that said, yes, I think you're of a quality and of a, of a, um, of a character and of a talent that you should go and study further and here are the places you can go. A lot of these people would say come to my university in the States or whatever but, but it freed people, it, it, it allowed people to, to take the stepping stone into, into training that had to happen next. You said, you know, you have been quoted as saying Dorothy Summers was your inspiration from the beginning. Uh, I'd like really to hear about her from your point of view because obviously she was was uh, a big part of your beginnings and, and for a lot of people and I think it's important to, to talk about a little bit about her and what she meant to the theatre. Dorothy, uh, Dorothy was, uh, well let me put it another way. I give uh, every year a party called the Jesse Party, which Jesse Richardson used to give at Christmas. And at that, um, on those occasions, I say there is a family that you are born to and there is a family that you choose on your way through whatever you're doing in life. And uh, Dorothy Somerset, Sidney Risk and Jesse Richardson were the family that I was lucky enough to find and belong to when I was starting. Dorothy was elegant, eloquent, um, had the most beautiful voice in the world. I can still hear it. Uh, she was inspirational. She inspired uh, almost everyone that went on from, from this province and this city and that university at that time was inspired initially by Dorothy Somerset. And the last thing she wrote for the UBC paper said, in the, it said, um, uh, theater is the pursuit of the good and uh, is a, a life of agony and ecstasy. These are Dorothy's words and if you could hear her voice say them, they, they make sense. They don't make sense when I say them, but, but it, and she, she used to say, and I, if you go on in the theater, I wish for you both the agony and the ecstasy. So, that's the way I think she got to me by saying things like that because I was a parson's daughter and um, I wanted to do something for uh, people, for my country, 
that was um, that was something to do with the pursuit of the good. And Dorothy taught me, you know, that drama meant I do, I struggle, and that acting was something that you had to do. And the basic formula is not how do you do it, but how do I do this, but why and what. Um, she, she gave me all the basic lessons of acting and of directing that, that, were the, that never changed. They got more sophisticated, and other people said the same things in the same in another way. But this was the way that that stuck from the beginning. Uh, she gave you a, a vision of um, what theater could do and what it was, and and its link to the good, or its link, if you like, to the religious life, the calling, and it was a calling. And for me, it was a calling. Uh, initially, w w w Dorothy's voice. Uh, I think she did that for a lot of people. And um, she was a very good director, but she was an absolutely uh, inspirational teacher. Sidney Risk founded the first professional theater in the West if you will accept that professional means you are paid to do it, even though that might only be $20 a week or whatever it was. He had three different everyman theaters, he called it. And I belong to the third one of those. Sidney was, was visionary about that. He was uh, persuasive. He was uh, uh, very, very personal, very human, in, and, and, and very instinctive on choosing his people and the right people for his companies. He was a very good teacher when it came to the backgrounds of the plays we did. I think above all, he was, t he was tenacious. His belief in the theatre was so deep and his, his wanting to, to found this company and hold on to it was so deep. The tenacity of holding on year after year after year. Uh, and founding actually three everymans. The first one was um, was a tour that were, that I think Arthur Hill was on it, but you might find that out from someone else, that yeah. story. He, ha he had a tour that went uh, as far as Saskatchewan and the bus broke down. The second one, um, these were really out, uh, out of Banff, out of Alberta, but, uh, but I think they rehearsed here, I don't know. Um, the one I belonged to was the third and last Everyman Theatre of Sydney Risks. And it, it was in a little theatre um, on Main Street, a, a block that has since been torn down. And we ran in repertory. There, how many people would be in the company? Oh, maybe ten. Um, we did, um, I think we did six plays in the first season. We, we pulled them when they didn't sell, and we left them in if they, if they did. We did everything. Talk about later was international players and what I had to do. But my preparation for that was probably the Everyman Theatre. No, every, I, I don't know how those two things go together. But anyway, uh, we, did the, uh, we did the sets. We did the costumes. We swept the floor, we sold the tickets, we answered the phone, we rehearsed, we, we acted, we, we learned everything about box office, about front of house, about how to sew a seam, uh, about uh, how to paint scenery. Um, we had a grounding in everything. It was like taking summer school of the theatre and making it last all year round. And the people in my company were all people that emerged out of summer school of the theatre like Johnny Milligan and Ron Wilson and uh, George Murphy and, <laughs> well, forgive me, I don't remember all the names, but it was, a, oh, Myra Benson. Um, um, these, these people had, had an education in the practicalities of the theatre that was astonishing. And of course, we shared the profits at the end of the week. It was divided equally among the members of the company. And it probably was about, at the most, $30 a week. 
but the practical training of it was, it was extraordinary. And this theater was so poor that uh, we couldn't afford to have any heat. And we must have opened in November, something like that, maybe October, but I know it was deep snow. And the theater was on the second or third floor of a, of a building. And, and there was deep snow outside the fire door at the back. And we shivered our way through rehearsals of Ghosts as it happened. I was playing Mrs. Alving. And I remember, I suppose I based all the, her feelings of ghosts and of fear on shivering, on, on being cold. And on opening night, suddenly, when there was an audience there, we turned the heat on because the audience have to be warm. And suddenly I couldn't. I couldn't find Mrs. Alving. I couldn't find the fear. I couldn't find anything because I was I was warm and comfortable, and it just wasn't right. And I had to go. I remember I had to go out on a fire escape at the back in the snow until I got really cold, and then I was able to come in and start the play. Um, the um, so Sydney um, was doing it on a shoestring. And um, I should now say what Jesse was doing all this time. Uh, Jesse Richardson was the sort of, was the, the person who loved theater and went to it all the time. Right till her death, she was all, she went to plays all the time. Uh, she used to be able to give you a whole lot of costumes for a, quite a big cast on about $20. Uh, she would take old costumes and put them together in another way. She would borrow, she would pleat, she would do everything to... to uh, but her area was the costume area. But she was more than that. I always used to say that she was the glue that held it all together, Jessie. She could work longer than anybody else. She put everyone else to shame. She was the oldest. Uh, she uh, would work till two and three and four in the morning and say, well, come on, we've got to, it's got to get it done. She was the person that kept everybody going, kept everybody's spirits up. And she and Dorothy and Sydney uh, used to um, take trips around the world together. Dorothy would plan it all, how they were going to see theatres in Turkey and in Greece and in North Africa. Sydney would do the driving and I guess Jesse looked after the money and kept everybody going. It's so hard to find the words of how important these people were in my life and in many other people's lives too. You know, we have the Jesse Richardson Awards, and this is this is a, this is because uh, of, of of Jesse's memory and in everybody's um, lives. So those were my theater family, and out of them grew everything I did. Um, when we started with the Players Club, I'm just wondering if there's anything. I'm just going to stop for a second and grab your man at that point, or was she? Because you didn't mention her, so I wasn't. No. Uh, no, Dorothy Davies was a, a leading actress here who uh, came initially, I think, out of Victoria. Right. She was my next but one neighbor uh, when my children were growing up, and her son played with my, with my children. Uh, so we were very close, um, but that was much later. Uh, Dorothy became uh, one of the leading actresses and uh, one of the leading directors in Vancouver, Dorothy Davies. Uh, the Everyman Theatre that I belonged to, that company, moved from the Main Street uh, Theatre in the year that I went back to uh, Chicago. Now we haven't even brought that up yet, but that fits in there. Um, in the year that I went back to Goodman to teach, um, Sydney was asked by two uh, businessmen, who I never met, uh, Charlie Nelson and Izzy Walters, who had run uh, nightclubs in Vancouver successfully. And they took uh, over a, a theater that had been a, a, a strip house and wanted to turn it into a legitimate theater. I don't know why. I never met them and I don't know why. I don't think Sydney went to them. I think they went, they went to him and they said, why don't you move your Everyman Theatre Company down into this, we'll call it the Avon, they called it. So they were after high class theatre uh, in the image of Shakespeare. And, uh, and Sydney and the whole company moved down to the Avon Theatre and 
as I remember being told, they, uh, they cleaned it, they painted it, they refurbished it, the actors did, you know, the whole thing. And then after that was done, I think they opened with the Scottish play, with uh, Dorothy Davies in the lead. And whether they had the three accidents, I don't know, but any time I've been associated with that play, we have. Um, and that started a new, a new Everyman Theatre. In fact, the, the name Everyman seems to have been dropped after that, slowly, but finally dropped, so that it was the Avon Theatre season. Dorothy became uh, Sydney's associate director, as I had been before, and uh, she directed, uh, uh, I don't, in that first season, uh, a play called Tobacco Road. I was by then uh, in Chicago and all of a sudden I started getting huge envelopes with clippings from Vancouver saying that the whole cast of Tobacco Road had been uh, arrested, the police had come in and stopped the show because it was obscene. And I thought, Tobacco Road? Obscene? Here I was in Chicago, quite a sophisticated place, and I thought, what kind of town do I come from that says that this play is, is obscene? And uh, so I, when I came back, I think I found out what happened, but, but on the surface of things what happened was that people were arrested, and uh, Dorothy Davies gave one of the greatest performances of her life uh, as a witness in the uh, defense of these people and free speech, it was it was, it was extraordinary, and you can find uh, you can find records of that, I'm sure, in the newspapers and this this uh, this wonderful performance that she gave. I found out afterwards that was there was a man doing PR for for Sydney by then at the Avon. He wasn't our PR before that. Michael. I should find that name for you. I can see him clearly and his name was Michael and I can't remember the second name. But he was very well known in Vancouver for hoaxes, um, which is another story, but he has many of them to, to his name. Uh, he was my PR when I went to the Playhouse to be the artistic director of the Playhouse and, uh, uh, and, and was very good at his job, uh, as you will see. Uh, evidently two, as we say, little old ladies now, I'm one of those now, see, because every time in a film it says, little old lady walks down the street, I get an audition. But anyway, two little old ladies were leaving saying, this was terrible, this was disgusting. Um, and he said, why don't you phone the police and tell them, says this PR man. And I think that's how it happened. The police, police came and watched it. And I think there was a place where... I don't know Tobacco Road that well, but I think Doug Haskins, as Jeter in it, turned his back to the audience and appeared to pee, and I think that was not, you know, that wasn't too much. So uh, that was great publicity, and that sold out. And then uh, uh, Dorothy directed pretty well a whole season, not using many of the old Everyman company that I had belonged to, but bringing in it was. Um, it was a kind of stock where stars came in bringing their star vehicle with them. Like Joey Brown did Harvey, and he did it everywhere. So he would come in in the last two or three days, and the other people would rehearse for, uh, I don't know, a week or more before that. So the whole play would be blocked around this star, and then the star would come in and, of course, reblock it and say, no, I don't want you there, I want you there. And it would all be reblocked in the last two or three days, and then they would run for a couple of weeks. And, um, so that went on for a while, and um, somehow I don't know how it ended because I wasn't here. But it seemed it uh, it it's, it. I know that there was a, I know that there were uh, debts, and I know also that Sydney Risk was the one that got landed with those debts. Although not that's not spoken about very much. But somehow in the way he signed the company in and signed the papers, he, it was his name that was the Everyman Theatre, that was the Avon Theatre. So when these debts accumulated, I think he was given or took the responsibility for them. Just because, you know, all the headlines. And... Well, our, our, our newspapers, see, our newspapers, I don't know why these aren't staying up. Um, 
our newspapers uh, still uh, go for news value of the arts. If you you know the the, the critics even go after. Uh, not so much now, but for a long time until very recently, they go for controversy. They, you know, if they can possibly get people to write and say, "I hate this critic," uh, that keeps the critic in place. Mm -hmm. it took a long time for the arts community to realize that, but the critic was kept in place because of the number of letters objecting to what he or she said. Um, everywhere, uh, the arts was when you were trying to launch a theatre, you were always trying to find the news item uh, rather than it being something that was important to everyone's life. I, 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 I sat next to a man at a barbecue the other day and I, I didn't know him at all and I, I don't know how we got on to plays because it wasn't anything to do with my life. But he said something about that he and his wife had lived in Belgium for two years of his life when he was learning his business, and now he was back. And what, and what they learned was the, the, the place of culture in, in everybody's lives in Europe, and that it wasn't so here and they missed it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we never have. We never ha it's never been a high... Uh, you see, I believe that the health of the performing arts is a thermometer of the health of society. I believe that passionately. So we're in a we're in an awful mess at the moment because as I took the opera Noah's Flood to Toronto, the CBC was decimated, as I took it to Ottawa, the Canada Council was decimated and the and the National Arts Centre is now an ordinary um, community theatre like it's not representing the country anymore. So all this vision that we built step by step is gradually being wiped out. And my hope is it will get so bad that uh, the pendulum has to swing the other way. But for me, it's always been tough, so it doesn't make any difference to me. I just, I just create the next project I'm going to do. Let's talk about the Dominion Drana Festival um, and perhaps uh, what was your first encounter with the Dominion Drama Festival? Was it, I mean, you were the Silver Cord was one where you actually were, were recognized for your work. The Silver Cord was Vancouver Little Theatre. I had done, in high school, I had done shows with the Vancouver Little Theatre, and that was their submission to the DDF. Um, Dorothy Davies was in it, playing my daughter. Uh, I, at, uh, how old would I be, in my 20s, was playing a woman over 60, which I continued to do until I was about 35. And then I started playing bears and birds and things for holiday theatre. But um, uh, I, I was just that kind of young actor that was a character actor, and I always got to play the mother or the grandmother. Um, Silver Cord uh, went to Ottawa for my t first trip to o Ottawa. And it was there I met Drew Thompson, who finally invited me to come to the International Players. The Silver Cord, uh, so it won here and it went to Ottawa. And the, um, the adjudicator had to be both, uh, had to be bilingual. Because the DDF encompassed the whole of Canada. And it was always the French companies that won. They were always ahead of us in creativity and in, uh, in everything. Uh, and it's still true. They, uh, I don't know whether it's, it's partly the, the kind of, um, uh, the kind of, the different kind of animal a French Canadian is. They are much more um, expressive and dramatic in the way they present themselves to the world in their conversation. And, um, and I miss my French Canadian colleagues very much. And uh, uh, so they always won. Uh, they also, I think, the compression of being French in an English country for the rest of it uh, always made them feel they had to be better than anybody else. And they always did the most creative and exciting things, with one or two exceptions if you go back over the history of the DDF. Uh, the DDF was a national institution that went for national exchange and when you met, you met people from all the other provinces. 
uh, and you learned the state of the arts in all the other provinces. It was very exciting. Um, Dorothy sent, spent a lot of time with the DEF. Jesse was on the on the on the board for a long time, um, and and uh, Dorothy and Sydney have submitted things. The, the silver cord was my experience of of Ottawa and of French Canada and and uh, of the rest of the country. Uh, I was very young um, to be playing that part, and um, the man Robert Spate who is the man that originally played Thomas Beckett in Murder in the Cathedral, and there's a record of that wonderful actor, um, pulled me out. I, I didn't get the Best Actress Award, but he gave me a special award, because here I was, a young person playing this old lady, and uh, he thought I'd done very well. He gave, me, he gave me an autographed book on acting that he had written, which I thought was nice. And um, so the DDF, not only was important to the country because of its uh, because of its exchange uh, between the provinces, because distance is and always will be our problem. Uh, it brought people together, and it also developed some of our founding and best directors and actors. Um, you could see other people's work; you could learn by that, because there were still no professional theaters and no professional uh, um, departments to. In universities too. And so, so I guess it was a top, in those days it was really one of the top honors for theater to... It was the top honor. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of the, uh, uh, of our best actors, of the actors you know as our best actors, uh, did that in you know, one. I don't know if that's true of Franny Highland. Um, she came out of Saskatchewan and she went to RADA and she was playing Streetcar Named Desire as the sister, Blanche's sister. What's her name? Blanche and, hmm, can't remember. Uh, she was playing the sister when she was still only 19, something like that, 18 or 19, opposite Jessica Tandy. So I don't know whether the community got together and sent her to RADA or whether she did win a DDF and, 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 and went via that. Both actually, so I was going to say, I think she went to Ottawa, but you, I also am remembering my research on about the community getting behind her at some point. Yes, there, so yes. I'm not sure which one which was the case. Yes, because she, uh, it was hard to go somewhere else. It cost a lot of money and um, we were just coming out of a, a war. Mm -hmm. um, and so somebody had to help. So why don't we sort of take a look at, well, staying with the Everyman Theater a little bit, but that's when you first had, well, you were you grounded in, I guess, when you went to Chicago, uh, Children's Theater, that, that was part of what you decided was an area of interest for you. And when you came back with Everyman, you, you did quite a few productions um, for children. King Midas was one of them. Um, was that one of the ones that stands out in your mind, or was there so many that you just sort of they all blend in? Well, let me... Let me tell you the story of, of, of this because it, it, it ties in sort of with the DDF. I'm at UBC. Um, I'm already, uh, I'm graduating. I've directed the Players Club. I have, think already have become an assistant to Dorothy Somerset and I'm teaching speech voice uh, in summer school. And I suddenly discover that it's possible to go on and even get a degree in theatre somewhere. And so I, uh, I went ahead and, and planned to go to Goodman in Chicago. And it's, it's sort of, it, it's a kind of miraculous story because I taught my way through UBC and through high school. My mother, I was an evacuee from, from uh, Scotland came with my mother, uh, 1940, 39, 40. Uh, my, my father died and we came to Canada. Because if my mother had stayed in Scotland, she would have had to wear black and be a widow and never do anything again in her life. And so she decided she wasn't going to do that. She was going to come back to Canada, which is where they, they first started their lives together and, and have another life, which indeed we did. And we came to Vancouver. And my father had saved for my education 
but when we crossed the Atlantic, the, the um, what was called the Sterling Zone closed behind us. So we crossed Canada on 10 pounds only, which is 20 pounds, 10 pounds each. And my mother started to work in Vancouver. So I had always had to work my way through in my education. I had no money uh, to go away. And by some miracle of time, uh, I had arranged everything but money. I got, the, I got the visa, I got everything to go to Goodman. I got accepted. I got, and uh, the week before, I had to go down to the American, uh, what would it say? Embassy or consulate. Yeah, the American consulate, I guess it was. I had to um, declare the money. And my father, what my father had saved came through just the week before. Um, this, is, this is long after the war is over. So, um, so off I went to Goodman. So a lot. This was something really big for, to spend this money on this. I thought it was wonderful to be able to get a master's degree uh, in theatre. But I got there and I thought, I didn't much like the people. I, I loved the people that were teaching there, but I didn't want to be like them when I was old. They were only probably in their 40s. And, uh, but they were all very discontented. They wanted, if they were directing, they wanted to act. And if they were acting, they wanted to direct. And they, they just seemed to be uh, a lot of unrest. And I looked at them and I thought, no, I don't want to be like that. So I had my bags packed to come home. I wasn't going to stay. And I, that day I saw uh, a woman who sort of bounced down the hall, whose every wrinkle went up. She was 82 or 3 when I met her, Corpenning, and, uh, and she sort of, uh, as she went down the hall, there seemed to be a, a kind of eddying around her, which, which was people, but which was also laughter. And I said, who's that? And they said, that's Corpenning. I said, what does she do? And they said, children's theatre. I said, fine. I packed my bags and I stayed and became Corpenning's assistant and took my master's in a, in a children's uh, play. So through Corpy, I learned the value um, of children's theatre. Uh, she was the one who invented it, because up till then, of course, children's theatre was children playing for adults, really, because children don't really play for children. It's the adults that go and think they're wonderful. And what they do at children, for the most part, is, is uh, copy what, what they think the adults want them to do, and they do it. This was to give the children the very, very best that you could. This was to get the finest actors you could, the best sets and costumes and everything, and give them something uh, that was uh, uh, of high quality. At the same time, use it for the pursuit of the good. It, it, Corpy went through uh, into theater and children's theater through sociology, where she taught huge groups of children in um, what was called creative drama, which Winifred Warg had created at Northwestern University. And creative drama was where they created their own plays. And by doing that for years, uh, Corpy learned what children's problems were, and their language, and how to talk to them, and how to, in her wisdom, solve some of these problems. Um, so her plays were, for the most part, the great classical um, uh, fairy stories and things like King Midas, things like Cinderella, things like uh, Jack and the Beanstalk, uh, because these contain already great lessons in, in courage, in uh, how to deal with life. And uh, she had developed a lot of theories about, about children. She used to watch them every, every week. She'd sit this way with the play behind her and watch children. And if she caught a reaction that she didn't expect, she'd go and talk to the child. She used to say they change. They change radically every four or five years. And you have to rewrite everything to bring it up to date for children because they change. So she would not be out of date now if she was doing the same thing now. So here's another woman who influenced my life uh, tremendously. So I decided that this was what I was going to do. I was going to start the first children's theater of this kind in Canada. And Dorothy asked me to come back and found that at the Freddie Wood Theatre, the first Freddie Wood, which was uh, two Quonset huts in a T form, that where we did most of our early work that really formed the whole acting community here.
and directing community. Um, I came back for one year and worked with, I think it's one year, it, we did so much that I, I'm persuaded it was a bit more than one year, uh, maybe it was two. And I worked with Sydney and the Everyman, so I was doing um, children's theatre with him in the years in between. And I think when Dorothy asked me back was after I came back from Goodman having taught there uh, to persuade me to come back to Vancouver and join her staff. She, she gave me the Freddie Wood. So that's how Holiday Theatre started, uh, which was um, the first children's, professional children's theatre in Canada. Um, but in the early days I had already been influenced by Corpenning and I did the deal with Sydney was, yes, I would direct some of the adult plays, and yes, I would be in them as an actor, but I had to do the children's theatre on the weekend. So we always did on Saturday uh, afternoon, and um, it was more than one show. So whether it was Saturday afternoon and evening, or whether we weren't playing on Sundays in those days, so... The, but anyway, every weekend we did the shows. No, I don't remember... I remember King Midas because it was my thesis show at Goodman. Mm the one where I did a, a study of it, of the audience and of, the, of directing the play. Uh, so I very well might have done it as my first show with Sydney. I remember more doing um, Rumpelstiltskin, um, Red Riding Hood. I remember doing the musicals. I started doing musicals at Christmas of The Three Bears and things like that that became the first plays of Holiday Theatre later. And Jesse Richardson did all your. And Jesse was there in the plays. She was. Uh, she was in. Um, she was in some of the plays of Sydney in, in the adult repertory, and she was in the children's plays as well. And we were all in the summer, teaching for Dorothy Somerset at Summer School of the Theatre. So uh, when I uh, when I came back um, and started uh, Holiday Theatre. No, I've lost that thread, well, so I have to drop that. Can, in terms of starting Holiday Theatre, there it was, it was seven people. Oh, yes. And it's $20. Yes, okay, so we did summer school. Of, yes, it was at Link. Um, so uh, on the staff of Holiday, of the, uh, Holiday Theatre and in the company, in the, in the classes in the year, which would be 53, I think, um, there was... Um, uh, Dan MacDonald, who is now uh, head of ACTRA and used to be, was the one who led uh, equity out of the American uh, actors' equity into the Canadian actors' equity. Uh, he had thumbed all his way all the way from Nova Scotia to come to summer school, the theatre at UBC. Um, uh, Russell, Russell, Williamson, two, myself, Myra Benson, Peter Mannering, Jack Thorne, who is now my husband, um, who for a long time, 40 years, um, uh, Jesse. Those seven people, we put in $20 each, and we started the Holiday Theatre on that. And um, we found within the first year, playing in the Freddie Wood was not it was not enough. It was not enough money for us to keep all that time free, and uh, so we um, we went on tour almost immediately. We went on tour with, I think, with Fliberty Gibbet first of all, and then we, which I think Sydney directed, and then we went on tour with the Three Bears which was a, a Corpy's show. And gradually, because of Corpy's beliefs, I started to use her plays at first, but then I started to find my own playwrights. So that almost more than 50% of what Holiday Theatre did over the years was, was original works based on my experience in children's theatre and Corpy's experience. We, all the playwrights that were, um, that were around here uh, at some time or other wrote a play for Holiday Theatre. Uh, Eric Nichol, um, Betty Lambert, uh, Ian Thorne, um, mm, people who were, incidentally, uh, 
I, I would find through radio drama because it was the CBC that developed in both radio and television all the people that became playwrights with the exception of this last generation who have grown up with some theatre around and therefore can go straight in. But in my time it was the CBC and the universities that cradled all the talent, the, the acting talent, the playwriting talent, the uh, director, directing talent. You, uh, well, you know, there's a quote here about 60 towns and 6,000 miles and 2,000 children, and you must have faced a lot of challenges in those road trips, so to speak, in terms of the venues. They must have been from, they must have been pretty simplistic, simple, and were there unusual challenges that you had to face in putting on these plays sometimes in some of these smaller uh, places you went? <laughs> um, well, we were, at that time, we were playing to people that had never seen a play before. Um, we were also playing to audiences that were too big. Uh, later, we decide we would say no, only so many people in the gym at a time, and we started to do, to do Brian Way's kind of theater where there would only be two two hundred people watching a play. But but in those days, it was packed houses, and we had to use everything we knew of uh, of holding an audience. Of it was very difficult uh, for the actors sometimes to 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 believe that the only way to hold them was to get them to believe. If they could believe in what was happening and the story was clear, we could hold them. Because in Corpy's plays, there, she said this, the attention span is five minutes, and therefore in every five minutes there would be what she called an exercise point, which would be a place where they stood up and yelled, or, or there was a chase or something, and they got all involved, and they got all the wriggles out of them, and, and then they'd settle down again. And the, the, it was very, very... Uh, uh, subtle and clever the way she wrote. Um, so we tried to do that with the plays that we got written for us too. I think it was very hard for the actors but they learned an awful lot from doing it. But what happened was that they would get, there was so, there was so much demand after a while. I mean they were playing every day for months at a time and sometimes more than one show a day that we added, I think in, I don't know what year it would be, but I would think it would be about the fourth or fifth year, we added a show for high schools, which was, a, um, which was based on Shakespeare, on scenes from Shakespeare. And these would be very carefully crafted by a playwright. Uh, for instance, there was one um, called Shakespeare in Orbit, which was done right after the first... Um, astronaut went up into orbit and it apart from doing the Shakespeare scenes it taught it taught them how there are many many thousands of experiments before you can send a man in orbit and it's very brave that he you know that he goes on but but there are many many lives that have been uh, dedicated and and uh, sacrificed to that event in the same way, um, uh, there were many, many playwrights and things that happened before this one person uh, that we call Shakespeare uh, went into orbit in, in, in theater. And so we would do scenes from, uh, from the Greeks and scenes from medieval drama and so on into scenes from Shakespeare. There was one we did on advertising which was um, what it, 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 when, you, when you advertise, you say, you know, you will be beautiful if you use this soap. Uh, you will be wealthy if you smoke this cigarette, and so on. And um, that, of course, in all the big scenes in all drama, particularly Shakespeare, uh, in, in the scenes where one is persuading someone to do something, it is always in terms of, of their courage. For instance, in the Scottish play, uh, um, she persuades her husband to kill Duncan and says he's a coward if he doesn't do that. Uh, Richard persuading Anne to marry him is, a, is an extraordinary piece of selling himself and so on. Uh, and so this is how we did it and we managed to get shakes. We did also did um, a modern version of, uh, of Romeo and Juliet, which was at the time of the, uh, the, the combs and the long hair. And, uh, uh, they went 
they had no idea that that was what it was about, you know, and they thought it was wonderful. I always remember. In fact, I think there is a tape around about that tour, about, about the bus going out. I can't remember what it's called, something on wheels. Maybe the red bus, because that was a, it was a red bus, wasn't it? It was a school bus. Yeah. It was a school bus that uh, we got, uh, we bought from this, the school board, fixed up. I don't remember the year when the bus turned over. I have sort of, since you brought it up, I have a sort of memory that probably that was true, but I don't remember. I'm going to have to ask about that. It's funny. There are... Your, your life, uh, you cannot carry in your life all the things that have happened to you or all your memories of a certain time. They sort of close themselves up in, in envelopes and then all of a sudden something happens. Someone meets you in the street and they say, you don't remember me, do you? And I say, no, that's your life. And they say, well, I was a rabbit in Noah's flood or something. And a whole envelope opens up of that period of time and you suddenly remember it all. Mm. Uh, it, it's very interesting, I suppose, but... It's very hard to deal with. I don't know why this business of talking about your life and what happened. It's a responsibility. Uh, I mean, Christopher Newton is always saying quite fiercely, you have to take some time out and write all this down, you know, all that you know, because nobody else was there. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to because everything's always so urgent in this country. You know, you, you set something up and then it disappears or it's in danger and you keep, you keep going and in... in Acting, which is what I've been doing for the last 20 years until very recently, uh, it's the moment. You, you train yourself to live in the moment only. And when it, the play is over, you train yourself to let it go, like a small death. You know, it's air now, and you let it go, and you go on to the next thing. So maybe that is why this kind of recalling, uh, it's so full of so many things that were life itself, uh, uh, and many tragedies, and um, and it's very hard to trigger it all exactly right. So I, mean, I mean, it wouldn't be at all surprised if someone came along and said, uh, you know, there were two, twice when the bus rolled over, or uh, mm. that those weren't the, the original people that gave the twenty dollars. Sydney was one of them, yeah. and uh, it's hard. Oh. It's really difficult and very interesting to do it. And you feel a great responsibility for um, for remembering properly, because a lot of it was miraculous. Mm. Those tours going out, um, I didn't go with them. I went the first year only. But I developed a way of spot-checking them through the province and being able to give notes that, would, that they could keep working on for the next two or three weeks. But those tours that went out were... That was brave. I mean, no one would ever do that now. And they were, um, we paid their, uh, I think, room and board, something like that, and something like $35 a week. I mean, wonderful experience, but uh, everyone would start out so enthusiastic and say, I'm going to write a diary and I will bring it back and you know, I'll write to you every day and you can keep it. And they would start, for the first two weeks, they'd start and send you a copy of what they had written. And then it would stop. And after you'd say, what happened to your diary? Oh, I kept it. Oh, I couldn't give that to anyone. Because it had been quite an experience where at the beginning there were people that you loved and you hated them by the end and vice versa. But you did learn that it didn't matter, that it could not affect the show. And it didn't matter whether you loved or hated, as long as you respected the person's work and it didn't affect the play, it was all right.